most interesting things about being a doctor is recognizing how easy it is for people to deny what is obvious to somebody who's close to them. Do you ever do that? Welcome to the Doctor's Mentor Show. If you believe that medicine is an industry and not a profession, if you enjoy submitting complex reimbursement claims, or you would do another residency just for fun, be advised, you're about to be offended. You should probably leave now. All this talk about mentoring doctors is ridiculous. I thought doctors learned to do everything better than everyone else the first year of medical school. At least that's the way they act. If you love assisting patients with vitality breakthroughs, if the right to practice medicine without interference is important, and you want expert tips for practice freedom and profits to support your epic life, welcome aboard and prepare to be blown away. The Doctor's Mentor Show starts now. Here's your host, Dr. Lori Barr. Today's episode is sponsored by Profitable Physician Podcasters. If you'd like to become one, go to podcastdocs.com, that's P-O-D-C-A-S-T-D-O-C-S dot com for more information. Today's guest is Dr. Centrell Crawford. She's an adult psychiatrist and her focus is addiction and recovery. She's worked in a variety of settings and currently practices in Pennsylvania, where she helps opiate addicted people recover. And she also works at the VA with patients who are having acute episodes of mental health challenges where they have to turn a corner and then resume their lives outside of the hospital. What's more exciting is Dr. Central has a book that can help you and me just as much as she helps her, her patients. And it's called The Urge Fix Recovery Guide. I'm so excited that Dr. Centrell is here with me today to discuss what's in her book and how we can prepare ourselves to deal with a habit we may not be facing or to assist somebody in our lives who's facing a habit and needs our assistance. Today's topic. The Lifesaver. Welcome, Dr. Centrell. Hi, Dr. Barr. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you today? I'm great. <laughs> Super. Well, yeah, I see that beautiful smile and that's your signature piece, and, <laughs> and you're laughing, and it reminds me that when we smile and laugh, that's one way that sometimes we can uh, let off a little of that stress that in, in some people, when they forget that, when they take themselves too seriously, then they, they start thinking they need to use other things to, to get rid of that stress. What, what have you noticed uh, when you've been dealing with these patients who, who are opioid addicted? How do they get there? What, what's the common path that you see most frequently? The common path I've been seeing patients tell me that it's pain. They had an injury. Maybe they were a football player. I've actually had a cheerleader recently. Uh, she fell. She was at the top of the pyramid, and she fell back. Oh, my goodness. And I sprained her back, and also her, uh, she broke a finger. Mm. Uh, and then she went to the doctor. They gave her pain meds. I believe she was 14 at the time when she started the pain meds. And then when she did her therapy, her recovery, and they thought everything was fine, they took her off it. But then she started taking her mom's pills. Then she went to heroin. Then she met me. And I was giving Thank her goodness. a stop. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Actually, she's doing very well. But I remember her telling me she had the injury. She was at the top of the pyramid, fell back. And um, that started her uh, journey into addiction with opiates. Um, I've had another guy. Um, he was a football player. This was a younger generation. Football player, injury, started uh, doing it there. I think he broke his leg, actually. Started doing a therapy. They replaced his, uh, I think they put a rod in his leg. Then he just had pain. And then he started off with opiates and Actually, he just did pain pills. He didn't do heroin um, because he was able to, because he had the ride, get some sympathy. Like, oh, yeah, you actually do have an injury, so we can just keep prescribing you. But, you know, the tolerance built up, and he started taking more and more pills. 
So then, you know, he started buying him off the street. You know, that cost him money and lost his job. So downhill from there. Um, so those are the most common things, pain. Um, I, I, I haven't seen anyone. I, we have a, a family friend who, similar story, uh, kidney stones. You know, chronic pain. And then, just like you're saying, get in the habit of taking those pills to feel good enough to work. Mm -hmm. When that amount's not working, you get more however you can, and then eventually lose the job, eventually right. stress your relationships, eventually wind up in inpatient rehab. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's kind of a scary place, inpatient rehab. Yeah, I mean, like one of those places where you go away and lock yourself up until you're no longer an addict. What do you call oh, yeah. those? Inpatient rehab. Okay, all right. <laughs> Just making sure I was using the right terminology. Well, actually, there's two routes because you don't acutely go there. If you're withdrawing or you need detox, you go to acute psych ward. Mm -hmm. Then I would transfer you to an inpatient rehab. They don't want you there withdrawing, having the diarrhea, sweating, um, irritable. They don't want any of those symptoms to be on their unit. They just want you to be able to focus on your recovery. So it's inpatient rehab. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have known several people who have gone to those types of rehab facilities where they're taken away from their local community. And then they wind up in a facility like that and they don't have their support structure, which, which helps them break away from the drugs. I realize that's the tough, the tough love part. I've actually also had people tell me that they almost died. And I do know one person who did die in that situation because an underlying disease was not recognized and dealt with. Um, so it's kind of scary. So if, if our listeners out there who are, are listening to this show because they want to strengthen their mind, their body, their spirit, and their awareness before they face a health challenge, what can they do to be a little more aware about what prevents a person from shedding these habits anyway? Like, we don't want to go down that path where we're risking our lives getting treated. How do we keep habits, unwanted habits at bay? And how do we get rid of the ones before they become a huge problem in our life? How do we do that? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so people come, there's many different reasons people start having an addiction. You know, either they have a stressor, they're having poor coping skills. So they use certain things. I mean, it doesn't have to be um, a substance abuse like right. opiate, heroin. It could be, I mean, my addiction right now is Coke. So Coca-Cola. I mean, let's let's Coca be clear here. Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. <laughs> Coca-Cola. <laughs> Coca the, the red can. Like the real thing. Uh, the real <laughs> thing, yes, exactly. <laughs> but uh, if I'm stressed, if I'm overworked, if I feel tired, I grab it. So it, for some reason, I, I love that sensation, especially, well, it actually depends. I love it hot and I love it cold. So it doesn't really matter. Um, so that's how I cope. Uh, some people use uh, exercise, some people over-exercise. I mean, what about those uh, adrenaline junkies who jump out of planes every other week? Or the people who uh, extend the poles across skyscrapers seriously that's dangerous <laughs> um so people just do different things when they're feeling depressed or they're just having actually some people use it when they're excited because they don't know how to just channel that energy so i find that when people are trying to kick the habit my uh well i was thinking of something so are you saying then that if a person doesn't have well-developed skills for dealing with either healthy emotions like excitement or unhealthy emotions like disappointment that leads to depression, mm -hmm. that they're more likely to lean on some kind of a crutch, pornography, sex addiction, uh, right. addiction, any kind of addiction, uh, yes. you know, name your favorite. When someone doesn't have the ability to cope with excitement or even unhealthy or depression or sadness, then yes, they do use a crutch to um, to get through the day. And they find that the crutch is uh, 
not useful for them anymore. They're having problems with their wife, their husband. They're not showing up for work. Um, they're not feeding their kids. Whatever it is that happens to them that makes them think, well, maybe I should change this, then there's some confusion and some fear and anxiety that leads them to uh, be fearful of the change. Because how will they cope with the excitement? How will they cope with the stress? How will they deal with the depression? I don't know. So those are the things I find. I can, I can see that. I can see that in the work environment around me. Um, so let's talk a little bit about if, if someone wants to, let's, let's say it's not really me or you that has the problem, but we have somebody in our family who's struggling with a habit that doesn't serve them. And they may or may not be willing to let us assist them. What, what's the best way we can be of assistance? Let's say they're denying. They deny. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there's this thing about helper and enabler. So I think you have to have some compassion. You have to listen to the person, try to figure out what's going on with them. Um, but also you can't feed into their... Uh, their habit. I mean, they, you can't, when they call you and they're in trouble, you know, there's only so many times that you need to run out there and try to save them. They have to realize that they have to save themselves at times. Does that make well, sense? Well, what if it's not such a bad habit? Like maybe it's just overeating, let's say. So how do you, how do you assist somebody in recognizing that they would feel so much better if they shed that extra energy they were storing on their bodies? Mm -hmm. um, or uh, how can we assist in those cases? But even with those cases, if you look at a person who overeats, there's some family members that's feeding them because, you know, depends on what we're talking about. Are we talking about 300 pounder or 600 pounder or just like, <laughs> <laughs> I never thought about a 600 pounder actually. <laughs> so... I mean, there are 600 pounders. I mean, so let's say it's just someone like, who can walk around, who can, uh, who's just overeating, maybe binge eating. Um, sometimes you tell them, you know, maybe we can have a, replace that with a, a, a fruit. Let's have a salad. But if it's sometimes like, there are times when people who are the 600 pounders, when they go far over there, uh, the family is actually feeding them because now they can't walk. They have limited mobility. So you really have to be careful to, um, not enable the person. So, so how be, would I recognize in me if I was developing enabling behaviors? How would I know that? So here's how I recognize that I'm enabling. When I'm starting to feel frustration that the person keeps calling me about things that I know that they should change. So, and I'm starting to make excuses to them, to myself and to them, about why either I can't do it or I should do it or things like, or. or so, it, so it sounds like you start having an irrational conversation with yourself about your own behavior. Is that accurate? Yes. So you okay. feel in yourself, like I'm not helping this person. What am I doing? And they just keep calling and you give them that extra $20. You give them that extra, uh, McDonald big Mac meal. Um, and then you just start feeling bad about you start, you start feeling bad. You start feeling bad about what you're doing to yourself because you're constantly running and trying to fix their problems, and also you feel bad because you know that they're destroying themselves. So, so just like the addict who recognizes, who wakes up from denial and recognizes they have a problem that needs changing, and they start feeling confusion and fear about change. It sounds like the enabler when they're faced with their own behavior, also experiences confusion. Yes, they also experience confusion. And often they try to get other people to help them control the other person's behavior. This one patient I had who had, she may have just had like the superstar of enablers. Um, she would call me five times a day because he's calling her, telling her things that I put restriction on him for her. So she's calling me to say, well, you know, he's really having a hard time. 
I know he's having a hard time, but he can't have this. You know, he needs to stop and think about what's going on with him. But what about this? No. You need... <laughs> it was just a mess. And then he gets mad at me. She's mad at me. She's mad at her for not convincing me. And so it's like this circle of chaos. And then in the end, he leaves my unit with her and end up right back at square one because he didn't want to listen to my plan. And she was feeding into that. And the plan was for him to go to rehab. <laughs> so do you think that the manipulative ability of someone who has an addiction is part of their personality before? Like, is that part of the addictive personality or do they develop that to feed the addiction? Hmm. I actually think it's both. I think, uh, one hand, um, the person, let's say a person becomes addicted to something and then they have to start hiding the substance. Then they have to start telling lies to their wife of why their, uh, their eyes are red. Then they start that vaccine in their eyes and they just start developing these behaviors and then the behaviors just become routine. And then they go on to start, you know, when they run out of money because their wife is not believing that their eyes are red because they're tired from work or, uh, she's starting to notice that their speech is slurred. So she's taking the money, she's protecting their bank account etc. So now he has to come up with lies to get the money or now he has to start stealing from him, the family. So there's this, it just keeps going up just to feed into the addiction. And then there's other people who may just be um, manipulative in, as a personality and then they get it and that's just what they are. But I think the addiction feeds into it and creates sort of this monster so it sounds like what you're saying is that these addicts, they almost put themselves through a school of manipulation yeah. during the course of the addiction. It's almost like a training program. Brings them up to yeah. speed. <laughs> so, <laughs> it brings them... <laughs> the school of, school of addiction. You know? And they all tell the same stories. You know, they, they start out as regular people. I mean, they have families. They got mothers who love them. They have wives or have husbands, they have children, they have dogs, they went to school at certain places, they started this addiction, they started hanging out with other people with addiction, then they start getting drug dealers, and the drug dealers treat them a certain type of way, and then the, their friends are encouraging them to try more and more different things, um, more and more different drugs, I mean, and then the drug dealers they're buying all these drugs. They can't afford it. So they start stealing. They start, uh, stealing from their families, which is actually really horrible. They start trespassing. They start public. And I mean, it just, just goes downhill for them. And it's mostly the same story. Um, and it doesn't seem to click. And it's like a school of, it's like, there's a textbook and they must all read it. I know they're all not reading. They're all, like, all <laughs> following the same curriculum for sure. Yes, <laughs> so. yes. You know, it's like step, it doesn't matter how far up the ladder you are. are. Um, it all comes down. It just, I guess it's sort of the speed of the downward spiral. You know, but when I just, was, when I was reading your book, the urge fix recovery guide, one thing that really stood out to me was uh, you bring up the point of blame. Uh -huh. You know, because when you were talking about this downward spiral, I could almost hear the point where the addict says, well, you know, if the doctor hadn't given me those pills, I wouldn't be addicted. Or if right. my wife hadn't taken, if she did just taken all of her medicine from the dentist, it wouldn't have been in the house. She would have hit it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so what can we do to get out of a blameful mindset? How can we encourage, before an addiction strikes, how can we encourage non-blameful behavior? It's so prevalent in our society. Yeah, it is. But I mean, we, as a society, that's all we do. I, social media just feeds into this mass craziness of, you know, anyways, I think it just become being more self-aware, uh, 
being um, able to govern ourselves. Uh, it's not. It, <laughs> I'm starting to do Stoic philosophy, so I don't know the quotes as well. But uh, there was a quote where it says, um, "You can't really control the other outside world. You only can control what you do." And so if we just learn to do that. Like, how did this? How did me stealing my wife pills affect me? Right. You know, not oh, if she wouldn't wouldn't have left it there, then I wouldn't have gotten it. But why did I go in there to get it? I was obviously searching for something. I was obviously needing something. What was the emotion behind me going? What was going on that caused me to even seek that medication that wasn't mine? And and what I hear in the way you're describing this is an opportunity for people who work with you to not only not blame somebody else, but they don't have to blame themselves. They can right. simply reflect on what has happened. Okay, right. this is what really happened. There was a bottle in the cabinet and you picked mm -hmm. it up. Something drove you, something gave you that urge. Let's work mm -hmm. on that urge. Is that, is that right. what you help people? Exactly. So what happened to cause you to even want to look for that bottle? You know, what, what, were, what were you feeling? What was your thoughts? What was going on? Was there something upsetting that happened? Uh, so just try to figure out what's going on with you before you go and look for an outside tool to help you. So what are the three most important steps a person can take right now to kick a habit to the curb that no longer serves them? How do I start? If I have a habit that I want to give up, like you mentioned Coca-Cola before, you know, maybe it's just staying up too late that yeah. I've kind of gotten into that routine. What, what three things can I do right now to start changing that? Your next step. So first you have to, for me, first you have to identify for anyone, first you have to identify what the problem is. Like okay, what, so so let's walk through this example. So so Dr. Central, my issue that I'd like assistance with is I've been staying up too late and I've done it a couple weeks and it mm -hmm. feels pretty good to stay up late. So kind of, I'm kind of developing a habit that I really don't want. So I've identified it. Now yeah. what? So let's accept and acknowledge you're accepting and acknowledge it obviously. I so do. how can we uh let's make a plan. Now, I noticed in your book you had pros and cons. Mm -hmm. So is that part of the plan? Before the plan. Before the plan? Yeah, okay, so, so so what I like about staying up late is mm -hmm. right now it seems to be serving me and getting a few loose ends tied up that otherwise I wasn't getting tied up. What I don't like about it is it's really uh, slowing down my metabolism. Uh, you know, my body's more in a survival mode when I do that. And, You're you know, very insightful. <laughs> You know, so that that doesn't that doesn't assist me in keeping myself healthy. It it I'm more tired in the morning when I wake up, obviously, and then mm -hmm. I'm more prone to use something like caffeine to help me stay awake longer. Which, if I take the ca caffeine later in the day, then that helps me stay up late again. So that's kind of the pros. So and is cons. the having to take the caffeine the con? Having to take the caffeine is a con because. In general, caffeine's not great for you. It's expensive. I don't. Mm -hmm. I'm not addicted to the, like the most expensive form of caffeine that most people are, and I won't mention their name. But I'm not addicted <laughs> to that. But you know, any form of caffeine is usually more expensive than mm -hmm. water. For example, it's definitely a con. It's not a pro. Okay. So, are, do you really think that you're being productive? Well, things are getting done that wouldn't get done otherwise. So there is that. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, but you, what do you miss about sleeping? So what you're doing right now, if I'm, if I'm reading this right, is you're helping me reframe this story. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Just so everybody's aware of what's happening here. So we're reframing this story so that I can see more possibility than what I saw a minute ago. Mm -hmm. Right, because right now yes, I think it this sounds is... like not sleeping is good. <laughs> so you so, can just me. <laughs> yeah, you know when you're in a creative mood, sometimes it helps to not sleep because you get more creation done. Right, uh, different kinds of creation, you know, depending on what you're working on. But 
uh, now you're helping me see, okay, well, what else is possible? How can we get what you want, which is to get things done, without having to do the staying up late to get it? Is that right? Exactly. Is that where we're headed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So we're about to turn that corner here. So what is possible? What else could I do? Is that up for me to decide, or would yes. that be where you would assist? No, that's where it's up to you to decide. What else can you do besides stay up late and complete the assignments? Well, maybe I could make an agreement with everybody in my house that we would go to bed early and then just get up earlier and start doing the things and get them done before going into work. I'm actually interested in what are you doing with your day to make you feel like you have to stay up late to complete projects anyway? Working full time, like most people do. <laughs> and so these projects are extracurricular projects? Sure. Well, some of them are. Some of them may just be time of year, you know. S certain times of year, you like spring cleaning, for example, or tax time, for example. There are extra things that come around that take some extra work. That if you mm -hmm. happen to be on call, you know, I'm a doctor. If I'm on call over the weekend, I may not have time to do it on the weekend. So it has to mm -hmm. be done in the evenings or in the mornings before work. Do you feel satisfied with this? In general. <laughs> Are you sure? Most days. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know if I've ever told you my story, but when I'm mentoring medical students, um, I've been in practice. I, I, went, I graduated from medical school in the 80s. And I've been in practice a long time. And I can count on these two hands the times I've not enjoyed what I do with patients okay. as a pediatric radiologist. So that's a pretty awesome job. Mm -hmm. And um, the risk there, of course, is getting so comfortable that the job itself becomes an addiction, as you're well aware. But yes. that's the story uh, for another chapter. <laughs> well, wait, 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 wait. Would you suggest to your medical students to do those things to stay up late and complete projects or what would you tell them that they need to do to have a more fulfilling life take care of themselves first okay honor how, their body honor their spirit right how would you suggest that i would um well um i would encourage them to not fall into the trap of developing these habits in medical school and residency because I know, you know, you were mentioning the Coca-Cola issue. For me, it was Butterfingers. Every, oh. time, every time I was on call as a radiology resident, I would treat myself to a Butterfinger bar. So guess what? Here it is all these years later. What do I crave every time I'm on call? I <laughs> Thank God. I, I had a little... <laughs> my partner who had the office next to me at the children's hospital, he used to keep a bowl of Butterfinger candy <laughs> and I had the key to his office. Now that was not good on call. That was pretty much, an, that was interesting. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I just, you know, I'm glad he's not doing that anymore. So at least that I can, you know, not uh, uh, find myself in his office looking for those Butterfinger bars. So you would tell them not to develop habits. What else would you tell them? I'd tell them to, like you mentioned before, because I listened to the advice and I've read your book, but like, what can we do be to become more self-aware? How can we take account of the effects of uh, how these habits might, or how these decisions might affect us negatively before we ever take that first step? Mm -hmm. Like, can we look at that and see where it might be a negative before we even go down that path? Like, if you knew the bridge was out, you wouldn't drive your car down the road. Right. You'd take a different route, right? You would. You would. With the cliff, yes. <laughs> well, Definitely. true. I actually also, I was thinking about self-care, because if you're not sleeping at night, I wonder actually how productive you truly are. Okay, now, let's let's get this straight. When we talk about going to bed late, we're talking 11 o'clock. We're not talking about oh, 4 in the morning, okay. okay? So you don't have to be so concerned. <laughs> but still, you know, there's good evidence that when you're over the age of 40, going to bed earlier than midnight for sure helps you with melatonin production and helps you with human growth hormone production. So I definitely like to be in bed, be asleep in a dark room, before that, so I get maximum use of the hormones my body can make. Exactly. So, um, you know, for me, that's a big driver to get to bed before midnight. So when I'm already still wired at 11, 
the likelihood of me getting into good sleep before midnight is pretty limited. So it's pretty limited for me too. <laughs> But, you know, so pros and cons. All right. So what is a plan that you can do to get yourself to shut down? If you go to bed at 11, you need to at least shut down at 10. So what can we do? Well, shutting down, that, that word shutting down right there means cutting off the electronics. Yes. Early enough that I'm not still influenced by the, the stimuli blue light and the stimulation and whatever I've been watching. Um and then also having, making sure that there are no underlying emotions. Like for example, sometimes when I'm in the creative process, it's like, well, if I don't capture this right now, I might right not have it. So it's that fear of missing out kind of, you know, mm -hmm. so an easy way to capture ideas or information that's handy at the bedside that gets it captured, fulfills that need Mm -hmm. but still allows me to sleep. You can actually have a little notebook and just jot it down and then shut it. Yes. And the shutting I... is a good reminder that we're shutting this down for the night. And then we too have rituals. You know, we have rituals before bed. We, you know, we always read the Bible and things like that, that close down the night. So, you know, the cat gets in the bed, the Bible gets read. We pray for everybody on our prayer list. The lights go out, you know, so we, we have a ritual that we've established. And so once the ritual starts, that naturally starts that rhythm. It's just getting to the ritual part. Right. Okay. So you identified you have problems with getting to bed by 11. You acknowledged it. You talked about your pros and cons. And your plan is to have to commit to your rituals. So that's easy. That's four easy that steps. Easy. To change a habit before it becomes a problem. Well, you, yes. <laughs> and, and that's what anybody who's listening can do with any problem or any, any behavior that you know, if left unchecked, could result in an addiction. And just like Dr. Centrell said earlier, addictions are not just about substances. It could be addiction to work. It could be addiction to gambling. It could be addiction to the way the bed feels, you know, maybe you just want to sleep all the time, you know, snooze. Uh, right. <laughs> the snooze button, you know, so all of those things, uh, this is so amazing. I so appreciate you sharing these simple tips with us that can help everybody strengthen their self-awareness so that they can take control of their feelings and emotions and actually move forward with a plan for their lives instead of falling into habits that may lead where they might not want to go. Yes. So where can people get your book? Okay. Urgefixrecoveryguide.com. That's yes. easy. Urgefixrecoveryguide.com. The Urge Fix Recovery Guide is a wonderful, easy read by Dr. Centrell that you can start implementing simple steps like you've just heard. Thank you so much, Dr. Centrell. Thanks. Have a good day. Your next step. If you're ready to get your message out through podcasting and become a profitable professional who podcasts or a profitable physician podcaster, please go to podcast docs, that's P-O-D-C-A-S-T-D-O-C-S dot com, so you can get some documents that will help you start your podcast right away and know when our next live event is for profitable professionals who are podcasting. So go to podcastdocs.com. There's more to explore at thedoctorsmentor.com. Are you stopping at a hospital? Hello? Don't you know that hospitals are one of the sickest places on the planet? Don't touch anything in there and get out as fast as you can. 